So I'm going to talk about uh, an ongoing project today, uh, East End Jam. It's a walking, foraging, picking and preserving project that I've been working on for about three years. Um, and it was inspired by an unexpectedly fruitful walk in Stratford, just up the road from here. Um, and so it, that was back in July 2014. I was invited to make a walk connecting Stratford Station with Sugar House Lane Studios uh, as part of another artist project. And as I uh, sort of explored uh, the route that I might follow uh, through what's a really sort of unpromising looking light industrial, sort of vaguely residential kind of uh, city space, I was really surprised to find plums, elderberries, sloes, apples, and blackberries kind of in abundance. And it was that sort of summer uh, kind of fruitfulness that felt really um, like a surprise. Um, so I ended up making a kind of guided walk where I showed people where the fruit was. I had made a range of different jams from them previously, and then we, I kind of shared them with people on the route. And the, you know, the, the happenstance of finding all this fruit and then the, uh, the name Sugarhouse Lane, which uh, related to the fact that there was a sugar processing plant on the site previously, just kind of seemed like a perfect connection. So to begin with, the project was just called Stratford Jam. Um, and uh, really felt, you know, the, the, the base of the idea was there in terms of um, feeling like people don't expect to find fruit or edible plants right in the city. And even if people do see them, do notice them, they're often uh, worried about picking them. I found quite a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, I've seen that tree, but I didn't know what it was. And I'm like, it's a cherry tree. <laughs> of course you can eat them. Um, so the shared sort of walking and foraging opens a space not only for the participants to talk about edible plants, recipes for jam, pickles, chutneys, and memories of making those or memories of family members kind of making them, but also passers-by who are sort of drawn in by the unusual performance of climbing up to get something, leaning over things in the reach for berries and fruits. So I found that kind of um, spectacle of... of unusual behavior in the city. Again, re a really great way to kind of engage people who uh, just happen to be walking past. Um, and so following that walk in 2014, which I really enjoyed, the participants uh, had some great feedback from it. It felt like a really positive thing. I uh, started thinking about how I could grow and extend the project. And that's where this kind of idea of partnerships and collaborations come in. So. The route that I originally walked was right along the south fringe of the Olympic Park, which at that point hadn't been fully reopened to the public. And the London Legacy Development Corporation, who are the entity that uh, took over from the Olympic Delivery Authority after the Olympics in 2012, were working on a series of series of projects basically to try to encourage more local people into the park they were starting to reopen some of the access routes into the park and um, so I applied to them for some funding to extend the project thinking that would be great what a great way to kind of get people onto the park would be this uh, sort of this, this project looking at all the edible plants that grow there um, and that raised some really interesting issues. They didn't commission me in the first round because of an a unfortunate legal problem. So there's a bylaw in place on the Olympic Park that means it's illegal to pick um, any fruit or berries. So, but they did then get in touch with me and say, look, we're really sorry we can't commission you because what you're proposing uh, is against the law. Uh, on, on our site, but we really, really like the project and we want to find a way to support you to do it. So we're going to commission you under a separate scheme, but you can't do it on the park. So um, in this kind of process of discussion, we really talked about all, all the rhetoric surrounding the Olympics. It's, you know, the, the bordering boroughs are called the Olympic boroughs. You've got Hackney, Tower Hamlets, Newham, 
Um, and I think Waltham Forest just touches on the edge too. Uh, so the idea was to extend the project into the area surrounding the Olympic Park, um, renaming it East End Jam to reflect the wider geographical scope and inviting people to share in the walking, picking and preserving parts of the project as well as the eating. So in summer 2015, I led a couple of group walks um, in these neighboring boroughs, uh, inviting people to come with me. We picked together. We went into uh, community kitchens together and collaboratively made these jams, jellies, and chutneys. And then in September, we took part in um, a festival called Harvest Stomp on the Olympic Park, which is part of Urban Food Fortnight. It's kind of a harvest festival for the city. Um, and I produced an event called Jamboree. So basically the idea was it, it was a public feast of jam that was produced during the project. And over 800 people at that first event came and ate jam that had been um, uh, produced from produce, from, collected from within a, a kind of mile and a half radius of where, where we were. Um, and so as that sort of, I really felt that, um, that kind of, this kind of bylaw issue really um, still is uh, kind of uh, spinning around in my head, trying to work out how I feel about uh, having this money from uh, the London Legacy uh, Development Corporation and, and the legalities of the Olympic Park. So it's something I've really, I'm really trying to work with now. So one thing we did in those commissioned walks was we walked the, the line, we walked the bylaw line, and um, I encouraged participants to make an active choice as to whether they wanted to break the rules and pick from the wrong side or not. And again, that raised some really interesting conversations about you know, what are these rules for? What, what's the intention behind them? And I think actually the intention is to prevent people from damaging trees and bushes. So the wording says uh, that um, it's forbidden to, the removal of any part of a plant is forbidden. So, but unfortunately it's the way that it's applied or the way that it's policed that becomes the issue. And obviously if nobody's there to see you, then nobody's going to know whether you have got an illegal blackberry or a legal one. Um, I should also say, having had a few discussions with um, colleagues who, who are lawyers, they kind of laugh at me and say, oh, bylaws, they're not really, you know, nobody's ever, like, been prosecuted for breaking a bylaw. Like, the worst thing that might happen, you might get a fine. You know, it's a civil offence, it's not a criminal offence. So there's this interesting relationship, but the way that it's set, set up and the way that they're published, so if you go onto the Olympic Park, you'll see these great big notice boards with the bylaws written out on them. So they're very much constructed as rules and controls over how people are allowed to use this space. So there's definitely a real politic there that I'm interested in um, confronting and addressing. Um, in fact, you know, then my, my further research showed that it's actually more straightforward to pick fruit from private property because the right to forage is enshrined in common law. So as long as you're picking for your own consumption and not for commercial purposes, if somebody has an apple tree that hangs over a street, you're, it's actually completely legal for you to, to pick that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so this, is, this is an interesting issue that I'd like to keep working with. Um, so, and actually then I discovered too that actually the, the bylaw zone extends out of the Olympic Park. So my very first Stratford walk was all illegal jam. <laughs> Far more delicious for it. Um, and then... So, so although this project began in, in quite a solo way, the, the partnerships really started building as it started to grow. So I began working with a sustainable food expert, Charlotte Jarman, who was really interested in food waste, in free food, and in how um, uh, urban communities uh, sort of sharing cultures can be established that enable 
uh, people living in food poverty to access free food, and also with professional forager and herbal medicine scholar Jason Irving, who, who's also led a couple of walks with me, uh, looking at the more um, medicinal aspects of the, of the plants. So uh, the, as we continued to grow, 2016, again, we did a series of workshops. We fed hundreds of people at the Jamboree. Um, and moving now into the 2017 season, um, I'm starting to bring this project into, the, into Body Brain Bingo and um, really looking at the potential for connective themes. So, for example, the link between walking, contact with nature, and well-being and mental health. Uh, new links are opening up uh, with UCL researchers in ethnobotany, food security, and also, interestingly, museum studies, where there's a big project at UCL that's looking at botanic gardens and edible plants. Um, and also with... Uh, food champions in local schools. So I'm working with a school in Hackney, uh, which has an amazing sort of trailblazing approach to food. They have, their school chef is an ex Ottolenghi head chef, and she, she's been there for about two years now, and she's developed uh, growing spaces in the playground. The children all come into the kitchen to work with her, and this summer and in the early autumn, we're going to do a series of foraging walks and jam-making workshops with the kids there. Um, so this afternoon, there's also the opportunity to join me on a short foraging walk in West Ham, seeing what's here. And we're going to bring a few things back into the kitchen for a quick cooking experiment too. So please uh, feel free to join me in that. Um, I'm going to close there. Um, try and keep to Hello. time. Hello. Can we have a first question, please? Yeah? Uh, very interesting project. I remember that each time when I saw fruits in the city and I wanted to pick them up, uh, my friends would tell me, no, don't do it because you can go to jail. So we have this in our brain to not touch the fruits where, which are the, the property of the state or the property of the city. Was that in London? Uh, London and Europe in general. Okay. I've been, I think, in, in Cyprus, and they had yeah. oranges, very, and I really wanted to take one, mm -hmm. but I was not allowed by the friends. And my question was, how healthy these fruits are, C considering the pollution in the city and the fuel and this air, which is awful in, in the city, is it okay for us to eat those fruits or those vegetables? Thank it you. Is, you have to be a little bit careful about where you pick from. I wouldn't pick from along the side of a busy road, but, um, and you should always wash the um, fruit that you pick. But in terms of um, any pollution being beyond the surface of a fruit or a, or a berry or a leaf even, really the only um, foods that are risky are things like fungi, which um, are, are very, very efficient at pulling uh, pollution out of the ground. So, for example, the, um, the researcher at UCL, who I've been talking to, who's in, who, whose work is about um, medicinal plants, was saying he would never recommend anybody eat a mushroom harvested anywhere in London, even in parks, because the soil might, could have been moved from contamination, uh, from a contaminated land. But by the time, the, the, the way that plants grow, by the time you get to the fruit, even if a plant is growing on soil that might have contamination, it's very unlikely that any, um, any of it will be in the fruit or it will be at such an insignificant level that unless you eat kilos and kilos and kilos harvested from exactly the same place, there would be no ill effect. In fact, he was saying that um, it's, it's a lower risk than eating fruit that's been very intensively sprayed with pesticides without, without washing them. That, you know, the, if you think about the sort of um, poisons that you're absorbing, that those are more significant than um, city pollution that might sit on the surface of a fruit. 
I, I have a question, but do raise your hand and I'll, I'll bring the mic to you in a moment. Um, my question is about a, a similar question that I had for Deborah, which is in your practice you engage with various partners, mm -hmm. uh, people who just turned up and don't know what's going on, or they've heard about it, or you've known them for a long time, or they're supporting it. Um, how do you think your language, the way you describe what you're doing, the use of the title for the project itself, engages people or helps certain conversations go further? I think it's something you have to be really aware of, and I think um, it's, I think it's a kind of process of trial and error in some respects that you know sometimes you, you you're you're really enthusiastic about a project you're going in to speak to somebody about it and and you realize that you know where other people might have uh heard what it's about the the person you're speaking to just doesn't seem to be getting it and you have to find a way to um, make a connection with what their interest is or you have to or sometimes they're not sure what you want from them so for example when I was first trying to make a link with the school I was talking to the head teacher because I thought oh, that's where I have to start to kind of get permission and you know she wasn't she wasn't saying no but it was when I started speaking directly to the chef who's this food activist and campaigner it was like it was amazing because she got it and she's like, yes, we want to do this. This is something I've been thinking about. We're, this is absolutely a link we want to make. And she just basically told the head teacher, we're making this happen. So, uh, and then suddenly the head teacher gets it too because uh, somebody they trust or somebody that they're already working with can communicate the value to them in, in a, or can communicate the connection to them in a particular way. So it made me realize as well that suddenly I'm... You know, I'm trying to talk about key stages and curriculum and, you know, things that probably are already there inherently in the project, you know, thinking about, well, which year group might we work with and what sort of walk and workshop might that mean that we do? You know, if we're working with four-year-olds, we're going to go and do a little walk around the local park and maybe pick one or two types of fruit and we'll all prepare it and we'll make one sort of jam. Whereas if they're 11, perhaps we're going to pick as many different things as we can and then we're going to discuss what would they like to make and how might they make it and who's going to, you know, is a group of four kids going to collaborate on doing a chutney and another group going to think about a jam and all of, you know, so it's, I think once I kind of got my head around, oh, this is how I have to um, discuss it with them. I, I guess similarly with the researchers that I've been talking to, I have a look at what their interests are, and then I'm kind of saying, you know, oh, this could fit in like this, or have you thought about uh, the well-being aspects, or, um, yeah, there's, there's some really interesting research about how uh, con being outside, having contact with nature, having contact with uh, the soil, having contact with uh, growing food is, is very beneficial. So we'll take a question from Taig, and then we'll have to move on. Uh, but Claire's staying the whole day with us, and there will be the walk, so there'll be many opportunities for questions. Um, so, Ty, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just a, a quick one, really, and kind of leads on to what you were just saying. But I wonder if you have a sense of what the participants kind of gain from from taking part in these walks. What kind of impact it has on them? What what changes for them? Um, I think, on one level, it can completely transform the way people see the environment that they live in. You know, on a kind of large scale, I think it has that potential. I've definitely had people say that to me, is that they look differently now, so that they're looking at the world differently. Their eyes are kind of attuned, um, not only during the sort of fruit season, but also, you know, other times of year too, like flagging something up in your, in your mental geography to say, oh, I need to come back here. There's going to be an amazing bank of blackberries here at the end of August. Um, to really, really practical things, like people who now know how to make jam and are going to keep doing it, whether they do it with foraged produce or whether they're buying fruit or whether they um, have some other source. Um, and then I think there's a kind of uh, 
domino effect of sharing knowledge onwards too that people have talked about. So in terms of taking other people on foraging walks, especially because the, the way that I've done the project so far has been very localized. So people tend to, so the walk is devised around the base of a community kitchen and we target people living in that area to come on it. So it's very much about you know, although some people do come from further afield, it's very much about saying, look at what there is right on your doorstep, this free food that you can, that's yours, basically, that you can have. Thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs> and um, 